I enjoyed Elder Gong's talk this past conference and how he started with a nice pun. What do you call a dinosaur, he asked, who crashes his car? Tyrannosaurus Rex, as in he wrecked the car. <laughs> After conference, I jumped into an online discussion about how that pun was translated into other languages by the official Liahona magazine translators. In Danish, Rosa, and let me digress for a moment. I'm kind of in the middle of some major dental work, which will hopefully conclude by the end of the year. My hard palate is now harder and softer, a different shape, and I have new teeth, among other changes. I can now openly smile after about a decade of trying to hide my teeth, which I'm grateful for, but I now have a tendency to whistle on my S's like Owl and Winnie the Pooh. I also get to relearn what it feels like in my face to make a smile that looks good to all of you out there because my muscle memory does not completely support the current configuration. Point is, if you hear me and it hurts your ears, uh, then I'm sorry. Um, we just have to push through as best we can, and uh, hopefully it's not such a bad experience that we all forswear this from happening again. I'm grateful to be moving forward with my teeth. Anyway, back to the Liahona translation of Elder Gong's pun. In Danish, Rus basically means drunk, so the Danish translator wrote Tyrannos Avarus, or the drunk dino is the crashing dino. In French, they changed it from a crashed car to a crashed bicycle. And then since Velo is bicycle in French, they said it was a Velociraptor. <laughs> you might ask, why am I spending my time talking about puns? Because puns are the ironic priesthood, the preparatory stage to the Melchizedek priesthood of really understanding the metaphorical language of the scriptures and better learning what to express gratitude for. And I'm getting to the more in-depth explanation. Jesus used many puns and they're clearly scripturally sanctioned. The scriptures don't just contain puns, though. There's lots of wordplay with allegories and metaphors, sometimes embedded within more complex, physically structured poetry. The scriptures are full of symbolism, visually and figuratively mixing things together to create a synthesis greater than the sum of its individual parts. One prophet is quoted by more other prophets than anyone else. Nephi and Jesus both tell us this other prophet is awesome. You need to read more of what he wrote. And if you love puns, then you'll love your new BFF, Isaiah. Learning how to understand these puns and metaphorical language, learning how to use that language in our own lives and how to consider what else something might mean, how we can view this from a different direction, and how to better find the silver linings in the dark clouds of our lives takes time and practice. These silver linings may not be readily apparent without some pondering. For instance, the dentist told me I need to floss more, so I took up dancing. Get it? Flossing? Dancing? <laughs> it may take further discussion and pondering to best understand that type of language. For instance, what's the silver lining? What do I have to be grateful for if I lose my job? I haven't lost mine, but if I did, what would I be grateful about? Keep that in mind, so I'm going to circle back to this. It can be difficult to engender feelings of gratitude. It can be difficult to make yourself feel grateful when you're not in that mood, which is why we are encouraged to seek out opportunities for service. Seek not what the Lord can do for you, JFK didn't say, but seek what you can do for the Lord. When we serve others and they express their gratitude, and when we serve others and we express our gratitude, both of those, both directions of flowing gratitude help us better feel righteous joy. Gratitude is not a one-way street. We all know, we hear it often, in many verses across all of the scriptures, we are commanded to pray always, but we're also commanded to give thanks. DNC 59, the fullness of the earth is ours, and among other things, we must confess his hand in all things. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, 18, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. Colossians 3, 17, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Ephesians 5.20, giving thanks for all things. Mosiah 26.39, pray without ceasing and give thanks in all things. 
It is no accident that Mormon promises us, if we like reading the Bible, then we'll like reading the Book of Mormon, because they echo the same thoughts in so many ways. But I digress. Our prayers, which we should not stop giving, should be full of thanks. Multiple people in this last general conference spoke on the topic of how we can choose how we react to different situations. We can choose to be happy. We can choose to have joy. We can choose to be grateful. And we shouldn't just choose to feel that. Elder Kieran said, If we are gathering in remembrance of the Savior and the redemption he has made possible, our faces should reflect our joy and gratitude. Again, I'm sorry. I'm kind of relearning how to smile, so my face might not reflect that. It'll get better. In many talks throughout my life, I've heard someone mention about how someone got sick, and then the person recovered. And the talk was about how they faced those trying times through faith. In this last conference, we had multiple talks about someone getting sick, and then they died. And the talks were, just like the previous ones, about how the people living faced those trying times through faith. In both types of talks, the solution and the end results were the same. But I felt like the trying times mentioned in this past conference, which people grappled with, were perhaps a little more trying than in previous years. Sometimes, some expressions of gratitude fall short of the Lord's expectations. There's the famous story of the ten lepers who were healed by Jesus, and only one came back to offer thanks. Jesus asked where the nine were. Was he asking the leper because he wanted to know? Was he asking the apostles to drive home a point? Was he breaking the fourth wall and asking us? Elder Christofferson has a fascinating life history. Like him, I had an economic challenge which threatened the financial welfare of my family. After a couple months of that, daily prayers, etc., I begged God in tears to please help and to please let us know if we needed to change something else as what I was doing wasn't working. I had a sense of peace that night and then the eventual solution started the next day, although I didn't know it for a few more months, and the full solution took a few years. Elder Christofferson said, Though I suffered then, as I look back now, I am grateful that there was not a quick solution to my problem. The fact that I was forced to turn to God for almost daily help over an extended period of years taught me truly how to pray and get answers to prayer and taught me in a very practical way to have faith in God. I came to know my Savior and my Heavenly Father in a way and to a degree that might not have happened otherwise or that might have taken me much longer to achieve. I learned that daily bread is a precious commodity. I learned that manna today can be as real as the physical manna of biblical history. I learned to trust in the Lord with all my heart. I learned to walk with Him, he said, day by day. Let's not mince words. What Elder Christofferson described is difficult. It can be difficult to find and express the silver lining of losing your job, of having your career set back, or being terrified that you might not be able to support your family. But as we turn to God in gratitude for all the many things he has given us, like the ability to work, to think, to communicate, help will come. Maybe it will be an opportunity for other work. Maybe just a sense of peace. Maybe something else. When my wife, Lindsay, called me from Idaho Falls and said she was having an emergency cesarean for our daughter Eleanor's birth, I was working in Ogden, Utah. I got in my car and prayed and cried as I drove up the highway that Eleanor would live. But God's will be done. I told God I fully realized he knew exactly what it felt like for his child to die. I said at the time that I would rather not feel that, and if possible, to please let Eleanor live. But his will be done. I received peace. I knew that whatever happened, it would be okay. And Eleanor, thankfully, did live. I am very grateful for my children. I love them. But perhaps I would better be, pray for them and 
have developed a better relationship with God about my children if I did have more trouble with them. How often did Alma the Elder pray for Alma the Younger? And when did he start doing that? In all my trials and afflictions, I have had experiences in my life which leave me unable to, to deny my testimony of the inherent truth and eternal promise of the plain and simple teachings of the gospel and our Father's plan of happiness to potentially allow the entire world, everyone who ever has or will live, to return to live with him forever. I love my family, and I know our Father loves all of us even more. Families can be together forever. I know the Lord has many experiences he would like us to participate in and learn from this life. I know he knows us and knows our trials. I know he loves us and forgives us. I know he wants us to be grateful so we can feel more joy. I am grateful for the atonement of Jesus and how my sins can be forgiven. I am grateful for my trials, even the ones I do not like. And I'm thankful that he helps carry me in those trials when I can't keep walking on my own. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.